before I forget. And I'm going to share my screen. All right, can you all see the PowerPoint? All right, I'm assuming you can see it. Yes, I can see it. All right, very good. All right, so basically, uh, to, in this week's lab, we're doing nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is covered in your lecture book in chapter 12. Um, and we get into the breakdown of the nervous system itself and get into all the terminology. So we have several slides I want to go over with this. Um, some of them I'll probably just skim over um, just to save some time uh, to go over the highlights of what's important. The majority of this stuff is going to be on the physiology test. So ultimately, the nervous system is composed of two basic parts. One part called the central nervous system or the CNS is only composed of the brain and the spinal cord. The central nervous system is central in our body. So the rest of the nervous system includes all of the nerves that run through the body. So all of those nerves that are running through the body are part of what we call the peripheral nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system can be broken down into several sections. And all of the nerves that come off of the central nervous system will either be called cranial nerves. There's 12 pair of cranial nerves. Before we're finished, I'm going to pull up the engage manual and show you a little chart on that. And so there's 12 pair of nerves that come off the brain directly. <clears throat> and there's 31 pair of nerves that come off the spinal cord. In which case, we just call them spinal nerves. Now, we do have a part of the peripheral nervous system, which is called the enteric nervous system or the enteric plexus. This is a special part of the nervous system that's involved in adjusting reflexes for digestion. So that's why they show the intestine here. So in your stomach, in the small intestine and all of that, there's basically nerve fibers that run throughout those organs and help adjust digestive function. We also have sensory receptors all through our body, including the skin. So we've talked about some sensory re receptors, tactile receptors in the skin a while back. And those sensory receptors are always sending information into the central nervous system so that we can respond to changes in our environment. In fact, right here on this little picture, they show the Meissner corpuscle, they show a Raffini corpuscle and a Pacinian corpuscle in the skin. So the breakdown of the nervous system, as far as the schematic is concerned, deals with both sensory inputs and motor outputs from the central nervous system. So the central nervous system, again, is the brain and spinal cord. This is where we're going to have all of our sensory information coming in being analyzed. That's called integration. And then the central nervous system has the job of determining what type of output called motor output has to go to the various effectors in the body. So if you remember in, you know, in lecture class in chapter one, you learned about homeostatic feedback mechanisms or reflexes, and it involves controlled conditions. Oh, if somebody just came in the room, can you all mute real quick? All right, thank you. So the motor output basically goes to the various effectors in the body that bring about changes. So what you're looking at here is basically a schematic of a reflex. So what types of sensory inputs do we have? Well, we have something called somatic senses. And the somatic senses are things like, we know when it's cold, we know when it's hot. You know you're feeling something, touch. These are somatic senses. The special senses include vision, taste, hearing, equilibrium and balance, these types of things. But nonetheless, all of these sensory inputs come from special sensory receptors. Obviously for vision, we have 
photoreceptors in our eye. We're going to be learning that in a couple of weeks. So we see something. So we have the sensory input that comes into the central nervous system. And somewhere in the central nervous system is where the particular sensory information is going to be analyzed or what we call integrated. Um, there's different parts of the brain that are involved in integrating or analyzing the different types of sensory inputs. So we actually see, we have vision actually on the back of our brain at the, what we call the occipital lobe. We're going to learn that next week. Um, so different parts of the brain are involved in allowing us to sense different senses that are coming in. So the sensory inputs come in, the central nervous system analyzes that information, and then we have a motor output that would go along different pathways of the peripheral motor division of the peripheral nervous system. Everything you see in this purple box is the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. And so then what you're looking at in blue and red or would represent all of the nerves in the body, 12 cranial nerves, 31 pair of spi uh, spinal nerves. S these nerves carry neurons where some of the neurons are transporting information, sensory information to the spinal cord and to the brain. And some of the neurons in those nerves are carrying information out. That's what we're about to learn. So that's what you're looking at in this box. So this box would represent a nerve. Some of the neurons in that nerve carry information to the CNS and some carry information out. So we just call that sensory input and motor output. The motor output division of the PNS can be separated into two major divisions. The somatic nervous system where that particular motor neuron would go straight to a skeletal muscle. And if that neuron was firing, it would dump acetylcholine onto the muscle fibers in the muscle right at this area. This represents what you learn, at least in lecture in chapter 10, the neuromuscular junction. So when a neuron fires and fires and fires, the skeletal muscle will contract. This is what we call the somatic nervous system. The only effector for the somatic nervous system is skeletal muscle. We then have what we call the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is all unconsciously regulated. We don't have conscious control over the, the inputs or the outputs that deal with the autonomic nervous system or the autonomic nervous system effectors, I should say. Notice the only effector of the somatic nervous system is skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is voluntarily regulated. That means we have conscious control over this part of the peripheral nervous system. You can contract the muscle when you want or, or not, right? But look at these effectors, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and glands in the body and special smooth muscle and glands in the, in the gastrointestinal tract of the, of the digestive system. We don't have, these are all unconsciously controlled effectors. So all effectors in the body, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, we don't have conscious control over them. They're regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Now, the, the motor division of the autonomic nervous system is actually separated into these three areas. The two main areas that you're going to be learning is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, more so in lecture. And then we have this enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system only deals with the digestive system, deals with all of the reflexes for your gastrointestinal tract. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system affect these effectors all in the body, smooth muscle everywhere, cardiac, your heart, cardiac muscle, and then the various, some various glands in the body. So these two divisions of the autonomic nervous system are there because one division will turn on the effector and one division will turn the effector off. That's a simple way of saying it. One of them actually speeds it up and one slows it down. I'll give you a simple example. Everybody knows your heart rate increases when you run on a treadmill. One reason for that is when you're physically active, the sympathetic nervous system is firing. 
Well, the sympathetic nervous system releases neurotransmitters, specifically norepinephrine, that speeds up the pacemaker of the heart and your heart rate goes up. However, if you're just lying down on a couch when we're at rest or we're not physically active, the parasympathetic nervous system is firing. The parasympathetic nervous system fires and it releases acetylcholine onto the heart, which slows the pacemaker down and thus slows your heart rate down. So these are the divisions of the ANS that affect your heart in that example. One speeds it up and one slows it down. So this is basically the two major divisions of the, of the nervous system, brain and spinal cord for the CNS, and all of the nerves in the body are what is represented in this purple box. The nerves carry neurons that carry information either towards the central nervous system in, case, in which case we would call it a sensory neuron, and that would be called the sensory input. And some neurons in that same nerve are carrying information in the opposite direction, away from the central nervous system. That would be called a motor neuron, and that is what we call the motor output from the central nervous system. So here's what a neuron looks like. Neurons are fairly strange looking cells. They are the cells of the nervous system that are involved in generating electrical impulses. So this cell right here can generate an electrical impulse. The electrical impulse generated by a neuron is called several things. One, a nerve impulse or the action potential. Basically, it's an ele electrical impulse. So neurons travel in nerves throughout our body in the peripheral nervous system. However, we have a whole bunch of neurons, billions and billions and billions of neurons in the brain and spinal cord that do not run in nerves. There's no nerves in your brain and there's no nerves in your spinal cord, but we do have a whole bunch of neurons. So only nerves exist out in the body on the outside of the central nervous system. And nerves are collections of a whole bunch of these cells. Some of them carry information away from the central nervous system, and some of them carry information to the central nervous system. So some of the basic components of a neuron are these. We always have a cell body. The cell body is where you would find a nucleus and other organelles that you might be familiar with, like mitochondria at least. Um, there's a whole bunch of rough endoplasmic reticulum in a neuron cell body. And at least in neurophysiology, the rough ER changes its name and we call it the Nissel bodies. That's what the Nissel body is, the rough ER, if you remember that from general biology. Coming off of the neuron cell body are several cytoplasmic membrane extensions. Some of these extensions are called dendrites. And at least one long extension, relatively long, depending on the neuron, is what we call an axon. The axons are what I like to call the, the wires in the body. They carry the electrical impulse away from the cell body towards the end of the axon, in which case these little ends are called axon terminals because that's where the axon is terminating. If you notice on the very end of the axon terminal, we have a, this little bulb. That little bulb is called the synaptic end bulb. And the reason why that's important is because inside that synaptic end bulb are little membrane bound vesicles containing neurotransmitters. So that when this neuron fires off an action potential, the nerve impulse, when the nerve impulse reaches the end of the axon terminal and the synaptic end bulb, it releases these chemicals onto its target cell that it's trying to regulate. So the, the neurons in the nervous system basically regulate cell physiology by dumping out chemicals. And sometimes the, in which the chemicals are called neurotransmitters. Those chemicals can either be excitatory or inhibitory. Sometimes it turns the cell on and sometimes it turns the cell off, so to speak. 
Now, this particular neuron happens to be myelinated. Some neurons have a coating around the axon. And so here you see the coating around an axon. And this particular coating on this neuron is completed by a special neuroglial cell called a Schwann cell. The myelin coat, the myelin sheath that you see here, the coat around the axon basically insulates it. And neurons that are insulated with a myelin sheath send the electrical impulse much more quickly all the way to the end. So some axons of neurons don't have this coating around it. They would be called unmyelinated. So this is the basic anatomy of a neuron. Um, the dendrites, the cell body, axons. Sometimes there's a, a collateral that comes off of that axon. So it can go to more cells than just a few down here. We have a little branch on the axon, but always at the end of the axon, we have these axon terminals and synaptic end bulbs. And that's where the neuron makes a contact with its target cell. Now there's three basic types of neurons that we have to classify. Neurons can be classified structurally or functionally. The structural classification of a neuron is based on how many extensions, membrane extensions come off the cell body directly. So here's the cell body up here. And all of these extensions are coming off the cell body, many of them. So this particular neuron would be called multipolar because multi means many, there's many extensions off the cell body. So as it turns out, all multipolar neurons are motor neurons. So what's a motor neuron? Well, let's look at this chart again. All motor neurons carry information away from the central nervous system out to the body to an effector somewhere in the body. The muscles, your heart, glands, all of that. So motor neurons are always carrying electrical impulses away from your brain and spinal cord to go to the effectors in the body. And these neurons are called motor neurons and they always look like this because they're multipolar neurons. Now we do have a rather couple of strange neurons that are found in a couple of places in our body. Um, this is called the bipolar neuron. It's called that because off of the cell body, we just have two extensions. You have a modified dendrite, that one extension, and then that axon that comes off. So we have two extensions. So these bipolar neurons are found like in the retina of our eye um, and in our olfaction pathway, which we'll be getting into in a couple of weeks. The last neuron is called a unipolar neuron. And this neuron is called unipolar because it really only has one extension off the cell body right here, that one extension. So this one extension leads into a modified fiber. At one end, we have what we call dendrites. At the other end, we have the axon and the axon terminals with the synaptic end bulbs. Now, I should mention this. Action potentials always go from the dendrites down the axon towards the axon terminals. So same thing here. All, the action potential would start to be generated up here by the cell body with the dendrites. And then it would go from what's called the trigger zone down the axon to the axon terminal and synaptic end bulb. And when that action potential reaches the end of the neuron, the neuron releases its neurotransmitter. So here's a very generic picture that demonstrates how the neurons are interconnected from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. So all in purple again would represent the nerves in the body, either the 12 cranial nerves or the 31 pair of spinal nerves. Running in those nerves, some of them, they carry neurons that carry information in both directions. Some nerves are more special. They only carry information in one direction, neurons that go in one direction. But nonetheless, this is our generic picture. 
So what you're looking at here is a sensory neuron that's connected to a sensory receptor. This receptor, when it's stimulated, would cause an action potential to be generated and propagated down the length of the sensory neuron. Like if you stick your finger with a needle, ow, it hurts. That pain sensation goes down the sensory neuron from your finger up a nerve. This ne neuron is in a nerve to the central nervous system. So inside the central nervous system, either the brain or the spinal cord, that sensory neuron has two fates, really. Well, a couple of fates. It, it can make a synapse and communicate with another neuron that is completely housed in the central nervous system called an interneuron or an association neuron. So in some cases, the sensory neuron communicates with this neuron first. This neuron would then fire to communicate with the motor neuron that would lead the central nervous system back out the nerve to go to the effector. And that would bring about whatever reflex that we have to have. And I'll give you the very simple one. If you stick your finger with a needle, you're going to jerk your hand back. That's a reflex. So how does that work? Well, just in a nutshell here, we have receptors in our skin that would detect when we have that pain. They're called nociceptors. And a sensory neuron would fire into the central nervous system, specifically into the spinal cord. It would then communicate with an interneuron and then the interneuron would stimulate the motor neuron to fire information action potential to go to your skeletal muscles in your arm. Your muscles would contract and you pull your hand back. So we're going to look at that reflex at the end of the spinal cord chapter PowerPoint in a little bit. So this is just how the communication can occur. In some cases, the sensory neuron communicates directly with the motor neuron. So this association neuron is not even there. It just depends on the pathway that we're dealing with, right? So sensory inputs and motor outputs to and from the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. That's a route of information flow. Now the next couple of this slide just shows myelination. I just left this in here so you can see, uh, here's, the, here's the, the nerve, really the axon of, of a neuron in a nerve. And this special little cell wraps its membrane around the axon. This special cell in the peripheral nervous system is called a Schwann cell. And it wraps its membrane around the axon. So this is nothing but a phospholipid bilayer wrapping. So it's a bunch of fat that wraps around the axon and insulates it. So this would be a myelinated neuron. So there are some neurons that are not myelinated. Some are, some aren't, right? And this is what a myelinated one would look like. Now, dealing with myelination in the nervous system, depending on if we have myelinated neurons or unmyelinated neurons, the tissue of the nervous system appears dark or light. And so we call that gray matter and white matter. Here they show a transverse section through the spinal cord. Here's what the spinal cord looks like. You see there's a darker areas and there's lighter areas. The darker areas are called gray matter. The lighter areas are called white matter. Also in the brain, you see this little frontal plane through the brain. Some areas in the brain look darker and some look lighter. So we still have gray matter in the brain and we have white matter in the brain. So what is that? Well, all of the gray matter areas, either in the spinal cord and or the brain are composed of myelinated neurons. I'm sorry, unmyelinated neurons, unmyelinated neurons. So all of the, in the brain, you see this gray matter around the outside of the cerebrum. This is a section through the cerebrum. This is called the cerebral cortex. And so it's made up of gray matter, which contains unmyelinated neurons. And this is our conscious brain. This is where we think, we feel, we see, we hear, we can make music, we can enjoy things, 
This is your conscious brain in this gray matter on the outside of the cerebrum. It's called the cerebral cortex. And so we hear things and see things and feel things in different areas of this gray matter area. Just on the inside of that, we have white matter with interspersed gray matter areas. The white matter is composed of myelinated neurons. Notice from the brain to the spinal cord, the white matter and the gray matter is flipped. The white matter is on the inside of the brain, not the outside. And on the spinal cord, the white matter is on the outside, right? So we're going to look at, we're going to name these little areas as well on the spinal cord in uh, the next packet in a little bit. All right, so does anybody have any questions so far? All right, so the next thing we're gonna introduce, I'm gonna introduce to you are the different ion channels. The ion channels in the membranes of the neurons or really any cell can open and close with respect to different types of stimulation. Some channels are what we call leakage channels. And that's what this picture is representing, a leak channel. A long time ago, we thought leakage channels were always open. Now we know they randomly go through a closed and open state. So they rotate between open and closed states. When the channel is open, it allows ions to flow down their concentration gradient. So here's where you got to remember physiology 101, the concentration gradients of the main ions. So for instance, look at this example. If this leakage channel, which is being represented as a potassium leakage channel, if it opens, look at the direction that the ion moves. It moves from the inside of the cell passively to the outside of the cell, from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. The reason for that is because potassium is always higher in concentration on the inside of the cell than on the outside of the cell. So if you open a potassium channel, potassium always wants to leave. All right. So that's one type of channel. They're called leakage channels. Another type of channel that we have to deal with are called ligand gated channels. That's this word right here, ligand a ligand gated channel, or in some notes in some books, you'll see chemically gated. So what does that mean when we say a gated channel? Well, gated channels have a doorway on them. That's what I like to call it to make it easy. Basically, they have a gate. The gate can be closed or open. Depending on what type of stimulus opens the gate is what the channel would be called. So for instance, this is being represented as a ligand gated channel because some chemical, here they showed a little pyramids, has to bind to the channel. And when those chemicals bind to the channel, it opens the gate. Since a chemical is involved in opening the gate of the channel, we call it a ligand gated channel or chemically gated channel. So we have to deal with the chemical stimulus that opens ion channels, as well as mechanically gated and really what we're gonna get into voltage gated. So what is a mechanically gated channel? Well, it's still a gated channel, meaning there's a doorway or a gate on it that can go from open to closed states. Again, if the channels are closed, no ions can move through them. If the doorway or the gate is open, then ions can move through them. If we have a channel that can respond to a physical force and the gate opens, then we call it a mechanically gated channel. You can actually hear this video, hear me talk in this video right now because of mechanically gated channels. We have mechanically gated channels and special cells in our inner ear that open when a pressure wave hits the cell, specifically little hairs on the cell called cilia. When those pressure waves move those little cilia, 
it causes the channels to open and ions can move through them. And I'm gonna tell you the significance of the ion movement in a second. The last type of, of channel that we have to deal with is a voltage gated channel. These are gated channels, still have a gate on them, closed states, open states, right? If it's closed, nothing can move through it. If it opens, something can move through it. Now, what opens the gate in these types of channels? Well, a change in electrical potential energy across the membrane at the area where the channel is located. So I'll say that again. Some of these channels can open in, in respect to electricity is an easy way to put it. When we have electrical changes or what we call potential changes across the membrane by an, a, a voltage gated channel, the channels will open and or close. It depends on the type of channel. So if a channel opens in response to a change in voltage, which is electrical impulses, then we call it a voltage gated channel. Here they're representing a voltage gated potassium channel. If the voltage changes from what we are representing here as a minus 70 millivolts, and that number becomes more positive to a minus 50 millivolts, the gate opens and potassium can move out of the cell. So a minus 50 is more positive than a minus 70. Hopefully you guys know that. I'm about to teach you some of this in a second. In fact, let's get into potentials right now. I could tell you what the what these millivolts and all are. All right, so here's a plasma membrane made of a phospholipid bilayer. We learned in general biology. Phospholipid bilayers made of these fats, these lipids, is an insulation against electrical charges moving from one side of the cell to the other. So charged molecules or ions and ions, which are charged atoms, cannot move directly through the fat layer, the, the phospholipid bilayer. It's an electrical insulator. So since we have a membrane that can prevent electrical charges from moving randomly across the membrane, we then set up a situation where we have a difference in charges in the extracellular fluid on the outside of the cell relative to the charges in the intracellular fluid of the cytosol on the inside of the cell. And as it turns out, there's always more positive charges that accumulate on the outside of the cell than on the inside of the cell. There's more negative charges that accumulate on the inside of the cell relative to the outside of the cell. So look what we have set up here. Basically, we have a battery. A battery has a positive end and it has a negative end. So in some way, if we can connect the positive end and the negative end, this cell may be able to have electrical generation, electrical potential flow. Right now, the charges can't move because there's no channels. But if there were channels in here and we could open the channels, then the ions, which are charged, may pass from one side of the membrane to the other and disrupt this resting membrane potential. So this is what we call a resting membrane potential. Always more positive on the outside, always more negative on the inside. When no ions are moving whatsoever, we always have more positives out and more negatives in. And this is what we call a resting membrane potential. Now, what is that potential? Well, if we take a machine with electrodes and we stick an electrode on top of the cell and we take an electrode and we stick it into the cytosol, the intracellular fluid, 
and we take a reading on the machine, or now they could do it with a computer, you would measure some number of electrical difference. This is exactly what electricians do at your house with the little, the little ohm meter. They go up to a circuit and they stick the two electrodes on it to see if electricity is moving through the circuit. Well, we have scientists that are like little electricians. They can stick electrodes on and in our cell. And so look what would happen if we stuck the two electrodes on the cell and no ions, no charges were moving at all. If every single ion channel is closed in the cell, you would have more positive charges accumulated on the outside and more negative charges accumulated just on the inside and you would record a number. Now, this number that you're recording when no ions are moving is called the resting membrane potential. Now, in many neurons, the resting membrane potential is a minus 70. In skeletal muscle tissue, it's like a minus 70. In cardiac muscle tissue, it's like a minus 90. So the numbers can change depending on the cell, but nonetheless, this is what we call the resting potential. So what is, what is voltage anyway, right? I'm sure you know you have a 12 volt battery in your car. The big battery in your car is 12 volts. A little double A battery in say a little flashlight or something, that, that's a 1.5 volt. Well, voltage is a measure of electrical potential energy. How much energy can be delivered by the battery? Well, in this case, since we're dealing with cells which are microscopic, we can't measure in voltage because a volt is too big. We actually measure in millivolts. So there's, there's a thousand millivolts in one volt. So that's what millivolts are, a very small voltage unit. Now, the reason why we're learning this is because if we do open ion channels and we allow ions to either enter the cell or leave the cell, you're going to disrupt this resting potential depending on what types of ions are moving. So let me show you this picture. This is a very good picture to show really physiology 101. We have channels that allow potassium to leave a cell. If you open a channel, a potassium channel, no matter what type it is, voltage gated, chemically gated, doesn't matter. Potassium always wants to leave. Well, look at the charge on potassium, it's positive. So if you open potassium channels, you're gonna lose positive charges. And if you lose positive charges, it would make you become more negative. If you lose your positives, you become negative. On the other hand, if we open a sodium channel, sodium always wants to come into the cell. Sodium is also positively charged. <clears throat> so whenever we open a sodium channel, sodium will passively come to the inside of the cell. That means the inside of the cell is now gaining positive charges. So if we open a sodium channel and we gain positive sodium, positive sodium ions, the inside of the membrane is going to start to become positive. So these are the two main ions that we're going to deal with when we're talking about disrupting and changing the membrane voltage in order to generate electrical impulses, right? So if we gain positives, we become positive. If we lose positives, we become negative. Now, the one I wish they would have had on here is chloride. <clears throat> chloride is a negatively charged ion. We do have chloride channels. If we open the chloride channel, let's say this was chloride, not a positive, but a negative. If you open a chloride channel, chloride would also want to come in, in which case you would gain negative charges, and that would make the membrane potential become more negative. So if you lose positives, you become negative. If you gain negatives, you become negative. And if you gain positives, you become positive, right? That's a, that's a couple of scenarios. Now, Way back in general biology, you learned about the sodium-potassium pumps. The sodium-potassium ATPase uses ATP energy 
in order to move ions against their concentration gradients. So with one ATP, this pump will take three sodium ions that we gain and kick them back out to where they came from. At the same time, it will take two potassium ions that we lost and pull them back into the cell. So for every ATP, this sodium potassium ATPase pump removes three sodiums from the cytoplasm and pumps in two potassiums. That's its job, it's always on. It restores the concentration gradient because everywhere we're gaining sodium but we're losing potassium. You can't just keep doing that. Sooner or later, you have to take the sodium that you gain and kick it back out. And sooner or later, you got to take the potassium that you're losing and pump it back in. So you could have this performed all over again. So let's look at what types of potentials we have. Here's a number line right here. We have our minus 70. If I stick electrodes on the neuron and no ion channels are open at all, none are open, and I take a measurement, I would have a reading of a voltage at a minus 70 millivolts, and I would just have a, a straight line drawn. That's called baseline, the resting membrane potential, right? Now, the reason why this is a negative sign is because the inside of the membrane is negative relative to the outside of the membrane. That's why this is a negative 70 millivolts, right? Now, Look at this particular picture. All of a sudden, we, we're, we're recording our resting membrane potential at baseline, but all of a sudden, the potential becomes more negative. The line actually drops below a minus 70 to become, I don't know, a minus 75 or so. It becomes more negative. So what, what could possibly happen that could cause the inside of the membrane to become a little more negative than the resting membrane potential. Well, a couple of things can make the inside of the cell negative. You could open a potassium channel and lose positives. And if you lose positives, you become negative. Or like I said, what they don't have on this picture is a chloride ion channel. If we open a chloride ion channel, chloride is negative negatively charged. If chloride is coming into the cell, we're gaining negatives directly, you could become negative. So here's the thing. Anything that makes the resting membrane potential become more negative than normal is called a hyperpolarizing graded potential. Hyperpolarizing graded potential. So everybody knows the prefix hyper means more or excessive, right? Now I just have to tell you what polarized means. Well, your batteries are polarized. You have a positive end and a negative end on your battery. We call it the positive pole and the negative pole. Really the word polarization just means separation. So our cells are polarized because we can separate positives from negatives across the membrane. And if our resting membrane potential becomes more negative, that means you are more negative than normal or you're more polarized than normal. And we call that hyperpolarization. Now, the importance of that is this, hyperpolarizing potentials are always inhibitory. So if we have a neuron that is dumping out inhibitory neurotransmitters onto another neuron, it would cause that neuron to generate a hyperpolarizing potential, in which case then that second neuron would be inhibited and it would not fire off an action potential. However, we have some neurons that dump out excitatory neurotransmitters that cause the second neuron's membrane potential to become more positive than resting. So in this case, you see the little green line going up, it's becoming more positive than at rest. So what could cause the membrane potential to become more positive? Well, 
you can gain positive charges. This happens either by gaining sodium, which you're seeing in this example, or calcium, like in our heart. We could also gain calcium. Calcium is positively charged. So if we open a sodium channel, sodium always comes in. That means we're gaining positives and the inside of the cell becomes positive. We could be gaining calcium as well. It just depends on what cell type we're dealing with and which ion channels we have open. But if we do gain positive charges, you would see this potential change. If you would record it, the potential becomes more positive, in which case we call that a depolarizing graded potential because you're becoming more unpolarized. You're depolarizing. Depolarization is always excitatory. So neurons have to be depolarized before they can fire off an action potential. Our muscle tissue has to be depolarized before it can contract. So depolarization is excitatory. Hyperpolarization is inhibitory. So here are our ion channels again. We have some depolarizing graded potential caused by some pressure, the mechanical gate will open. And when the mechanical gate opens from the mechanical stimulus, positive charges would enter the cell and we have a depolarizing graded potential. This would cause a neuron to fire saying you feel something, say in your finger, so you stick yourself with the needle or you're, you feel pressure mechanical gates or something in your ear. We're hearing right now because of mechanical gates opening. Chemical gates open in response to chemicals. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters when they come from a neuron. If the neurotransmitter opens a sodium channel or a potassium channel, I'm sorry, a sodium channel or a calcium channel, sodium and calcium will enter. If it's a potassium channel, potassium will always leave. So here they show a generic channel, sodium and calcium would come in, but potassium can leave. In this type of channel, a neurotransmitter, in this case called acetylcholine, is opening the gate. So we can gain positive charges, in which case we become depolarized because we're gaining more positives than we lose. If you gain positives, you become positive. That's called a depolarizing graded potential. And we also have voltage uh, uh, inhibitory uh, chemically gated channels. Here's the chloride channel I was referring to. If we have another type of neurotransmitter, some of them are inhibitory. In this case, they represent glycine. Glycine is a prevalent inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. When glycine is released and binds to its channel on its target neuron, the channel will open, but look what comes through it. A chloride ion moves through it. Chloride is negatively charged. So in this case, this neurotransmitter would be called inhibitory because it's allowing negatively charged ions to flow into the cell, which makes the inside of the cell more negative than normal, in which case we call that a hyperpolarizing graded potential. All right, so we also have some neurotransmitters that are inhibitory that open potassium channels, special types of potassium channels, in which case potassium would leave. So in order to cause a hyperpolarizing graded potential, you either have to gain chloride, negatively charged ions, or you have to lose potassium, all right? So that's what inhibitory neurotransmitters would do. They induce a hyperpolarizing potential by causing the inside of the cell to become more negative. Excitatory neurotransmitters, in this case, like acetylcholine on our muscle tissue or certain types of neurons, we open a cation channel that allows us to gain sodium and calcium ions. You, you may lose some potassium, but not as many that you're gaining positives. So you gain a whole bunch of positive charges, so you become positive, 
And that's called a depolarizing graded potential. So why am I telling you about all these channels? Well, we have to understand the makeup of an action potential. So this graph represents all of the events that would occur in order for this neuron to generate an action potential, which is the electrical impulse that would be transported down the axon to the axon terminal and thus cause neurotransmitters to be released from the synaptic end bulbs onto a target cell somewhere in the body. So let's say this was a motor neuron of the somatic nervous system and your skeletal muscle cell was right here. This neuron would have to fire off an action potential which would cause acetylcholine to be released from the synaptic end bulb to bind to the receptor on the sarcolemma of the muscle cell to make the muscle cell contract. So how do we get that neuron to fire an action potential? Well, we have to have this. There has to be some stimulus. In this case, the stimulus is going to be another neurotransmitter and it's going to open chemically gated ion channels. So look what happens if I have a neurotransmitter that opens a chemically gated or ligand gated channel. I notice that the membrane potential becomes more positive. So just from this graph with me seeing that the membrane potential becomes more positive, I know that that has to be an excitatory neurotransmitter because it's opening a ligand gated sodium channel. We're gaining sodium, which is positively charged, and we become more positive. Now, if we gain enough positive charges to reach this number, to make the membrane potential go all the way to this po more positive number, in this case, a minus 55 millivolts, this number in this dotted line is called threshold. All neurons have a threshold. This threshold value is the potential that has to be reached before the first voltage gated channel can open. And that's what's represented by the green line right here. Henry. Go ahead. Oh, did you have a question? All right. So we have an excitatory stimulus. It's opening sodium channels, we gain sodium, we become positive. We become positive enough to, to reach this minus 55 number. And technically, it's a physical location on the neuron. It's actually right there where the axon reaches or really is being extended from the cell body. This is called the initial segment. And inside the initial segment is what we call the trigger zone. The trigger zone is where you have your first voltage gated channels. So all on the dendrites in the cell body, we only have chemically gated or ligand gated channels. So it would take chemicals to open all of these channels along this part of the membrane. So if we open enough of those channels and allow sodium to make its way to this spot, we would open the first voltage gated channels right there, which on this graph is represented at threshold. And since I see that the membrane potential is becoming more positive, I know that I'm opening voltage gated sodium channels right here. Voltage gated sodium channels. The voltage gated sodium channels when they open allow sodium to move into the cell again, which means we become more positive. In which case we become more positive by a lot. You actually surpass zero and become and reach the positive range of the number line up to a positive 20 to a positive 30. That's because we gain a whole bunch of sodium ions at one time. Now, what you're looking at with this wave is a tracing of the opening and closing of ion channels on the axon. So if I stuck electrodes on this axon and the, and the neuron fired off an action potential, I would see the green line and the red line. And then this little brown line at the bottom. 
If I stuck electrodes on the dendrites in the cell body, I would see where we have this little blue area, the stimulus. So the stimulus area is happening on the dendrites in the cell body. This is where we open our ligand gated channels only. And when we open those ligand gated channels, if they allow sodium to move through it, the chemical, the neurotransmitter would be called excitatory. And we gain positive, become positive all the way to threshold, which is at the trigger zone of the initial segment. We then open voltage gated sodium channels to induce what's called the depolarizing phase of an action potential. And then all of a sudden those voltage gated sodium channels close and voltage gated potassium channels open. They're all next to each other in the membrane, all the way down the length of this neuron. So the sodium channels open first, then they close, the potassium channels open, and then they close. And then we start the whole process over again. So look what happens when we open the potassium channels. When we open a potassium channel, voltage gated potassium channel, we would lose potassium, which is positive charges. So if you lose positive charges, you become negative. Now, as it turns out, we become negative a little bit more than normal because we lose just a little bit more potassium than we should. And so we dip down below our resting membrane potential. That's called an after hyperpolarizing phase. So we have depolarization, repolarization, and the after hyperpolarization, right? Now, sooner or later, that sodium potassium pump is gonna kick the sodium back into the cell. I mean, kick the potassium back into the cell, kick the sodium back out, and we're gonna go back to our resting membrane potential again. So let's look at what's really happening with these channels. Now, we have some of our ion channels have what we call an an activation gate and an inactivation gate. Not all gated channels have this, but what you're looking at right here is a special sodium channel, this voltage gated sodium channel and a voltage gated potassium channel. Right now, both of these channels are closed. No ions are moving through them. Sodium's not coming in, potassium's not leaving. And look what we record on the number line, a minus 70. That's our resting membrane potential. Now this is called the resting state. When both of these channels are closed and no ions are moving. Look what happens when we open our voltage gated sodium channel. We open a voltage gated sodium channel, we gain those positive sodium ions. And as you're gaining positive charges, you become positive. The number line goes up to a more positive value. This is called depolarization. So what causes depolarization? The entry of positively charged ions. Now I know I'm just teaching the sodium right now, but calcium is involved in certain electrically excitable cells in our body as well. So calcium and sodium can induce a depolarization. But look what happens when we inactivate the sodium channel and we open the, the voltage gated potassium channel. Now no more sodiums can come in but our potassium can leave. So now we're losing positive charges in the form of potassium, and we start to see this repolarization, this dip down of the membrane potential becoming more negative again. So now we have totally inactivated the sodium channel. The potassium channels are now ultimately start, are gonna to start to close but not until we go through a complete repolarization. After we are completely repolarized, this channel closes and we go back to the resting state where we would record our resting membrane potential. So this is basically an action potential. Sodium channels open and you gain sodium first, we depolarize. You close a sodium channel and open a potassium channel, you lose potassium, and you repolarize. Then you close that channel and start all over again.
open and close, open and close, open and close, all these channels open and close in order to bring about depolarization and repolarization. That's an action potential. All right, now, we only have a couple of things left on this packet. I know you're getting tired, uh, but I do have to go over some spinal cord anatomy in a minute. Um, but I did wanna mention to you briefly about myelinated and unmyelinated neurons and how the neurons generate electrical impulses and then propagate them. Propagating means to transport the electrical potential. So what we're looking at here are unmyelinated neurons. So as it turns out, unmyelinated neurons send or propagate electrical potentials, the action potential down the axon in a continuous manner. It's called continuous conduction. And for that reason, we have to open sodium channels and close them and open potassium channels at each patch of the membrane. Each adjacent patch of the membrane, those channels are opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing in order to generate and move the electrical potential down the length of the axon. So this takes a little bit of time to do that. It's like taking baby steps. However, if we have a neuron that's myelinated, so here we have a neuron that's myelinated. So certain patches of it are insulated. And so what we see here is the electrical potential actually jumps to these little nodes. In between where we're myelinated are little indentations called the nodes of Ron Veyer, at least out in the peripheral nervous system. And so the action potential would start at the axon hillock, the initial segment and trigger zone, and appear to jump from one node to another one. <clears throat> this is called saltatory conduction. So the difference between saltatory conduction and continuous conduction, the easiest way I can say it is this. Saltatory conduction would be like if you're running. You cover more distance with each step. And so that way you get to the end point quicker. Continuous conduction is like taking baby steps. You actually put one foot directly in front of another one. It takes longer to get to the end. So in continuous conduction in an unmyelinated neuron, it just takes a little bit longer for the action potential to reach the end. Now I say longer, it's on the order of, it's still in milliseconds. There's a thousand milliseconds in one second. But nonetheless, the distance that is covered, let's say within 10 milliseconds on a continuous conducting neuron is only to this point. But on a saltatory conduction, it's almost all the way at the end. So I'm not gonna ask you about the time values. You should know that saltatory conduction is faster than continuous conduction. Now, the last slide here is just a slide to demonstrate what happens with the release of neurotransmitters. That's the only reason why I put that here. And so what we have up here are two neurons. Neurons basically make contact with target cells in the body. It can be another neuron or it can be like a muscle cell. And where a neuron makes contact with another target cell in the body is called a synapse. The synapse is where we have a, a little bitty space. The neuron does not physically touch its, its target cell. There's a little bitty space between the neuron and the target cell. That little bitty space is filled with fluid and ions, and that's called a synaptic cleft. The axon terminal at the end of the axon and the end bulb, which is called a synaptic end bulb, is what's making the synapse with the target cell. On the inside of this synaptic end bulb, we have these synaptic vesicles. The synaptic vesicles are filled with the neurotransmitters that would have to be released into the synaptic cleft. So how do we get this neuron to release those neurotransmitters? Well, in order to affect the target cell. Well, let's name these cells first. So in this synapse, we have one neuron synapsing with another neuron. The neuron that occurs before the synapse is called presynaptic, the presynaptic neuron.
And the neuron that occurs after the synapse is called the postsynaptic neuron. So the presynaptic neuron is going to generate an action potential. It's going to be propagated down the axon to the axon terminal, come down the axon terminal toward the synaptic end ball. That action potential changes the voltage across the membrane, as we just learned, which opens these voltage-gated calcium channels. So when the nerve impulse reaches the synaptic end bulb, the change in voltage opens these calcium channels. Calcium floods the inside of the synaptic end bulb, and thus the influx of that calcium causes these synaptic vesicles to fuse with the membrane and exocytose out neurotransmitters. Now, the neurotransmitters are always going to bind to their receptor on the postsynaptic cell. Sometimes these neurotransmitters are called excitatory, in which case they're opening ligand-gated sodium or calcium channels. Because if you open a sodium channel, you're gonna gain sodium, which is positive, and it's gonna cause a depolarization, which is always excitatory. If the neurotransmitter is inhibitory, it will bind to its channel and open it, and it will either allow chloride ions to flow in, in which case, if you gain negatives, you become negative, which is hyperpolarization and is always inhibitory, or some inhibitory neurotransmitters open a potassium channel. So if we open a potassium channel and we lose our potassium, in the absence of gaining sodium, you always become negative because you're losing your positives. So this is how neurotransmitters really affect this, the postsynaptic cell. Will either make, in this case, the neuron will either be depolarized to fire off its own action potential. If this was an excitatory neurotransmitter, it would cause a depolarization in this postsynaptic cell or if it was an inhibitory neurotransmitter, it would cause hyperpolarization and this postsynaptic neuron would not fire. All right, and so that's pretty much your introduction to nervous tissue. Do you guys have any questions about this packet before I leave it? All right. Let me... Pull up this screen. All right, can you guys see the new PowerPoint? Yes. All right. I'm assuming if you can't see it, you would let me know. All right, so we have a few slides to cover here. I'm not going to, you know, I know your brains are tired. Uh, keep you for much longer, but I have to give you an introduction into the anatomy of the spinal cord and really what you are going to have to be studying over the course of this week. So basically, this is chapter 13 in the lecture book. It's a spinal cord and the spinal nerves and spinal cord anatomy. So I'm just going to run through some of the basic information concerning our spinal cord and show you what some of these names are. So here they show a cross section, a transverse plane through the cervical region, basically in our neck. This would represent a cervical vertebra that you were learning in the axial skeletal system. The spinous process down up here, the cell, uh, the vertebral body here, the spinal cord runs through that vertebral foramen. So this is the spinal cord. These little holes are the, vertebra, the transverse foramen that allow blood vessels and, and whatnot to run through them. <laughs> we're going to learn about these vertebral arteries in a and 2 But our spinal cord is protected by the bony vertebra, number one, down our spinal column. But also there are connective tissue membranes that surround our spinal cord, and those membranes are called the meninges. There's three meningeal connective tissue membranes we have to learn about. Um, and then on just circulating around the spinal cord is a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. So we have bone connective tissue membranes and fluid that help protect our, really our brain and our spinal cord. 
<clears throat> so here's the connective tissue membranes that protect our brain and spinal cord. These same three membranes would be around your brain. So we have an outer membrane you see here. This is called the dura mater. That's how you say that. Just on the inside of that is what we call the subdural space, right? The next membrane closer to the spinal cord reflected back in this drawing is called the arachnoid mater. It's the middle layer. Just below that, on the inside of that, is what we call the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space is the space where cerebrospinal fluid is flowing. So we have this special fluid, nourishing fluid, that flows around our spinal cord. It flows in this space, around in the subarachnoid space. Now we do have special little ligaments that are attaching all of these membranes to our spinal cord. These are called the denticulate ligaments. You'll see one of these on that on the spinal cord model as well when you start learning that. The innermost connective tissue membrane layer is called the pia mater. It's the innermost layer. It attaches directly to the spinal cord, right? It's called the pia mater. Now, the spinal cord itself has several things we're going to be learning about, the different areas of the gray matter, which I mentioned earlier, and the white matter. On the posterior side is what we call the posterior median sulcus, a little indentation back here. So this is posterior, and this is the anterior side of the spinal cord. And this area right here in the middle on the anterior side is called the anterior median fissure. So you'll be able to identify that on pictures and on the model. Here's the overall general anatomy of the spinal cord. You're not going to be identifying every one of these nerves in here, so don't panic about that. There are some important areas of the spinal cord that you're going to have to be able to identify. Um, ultimately, we have two major enlargements. So the spinal cord number one is an extension from the brain, really the medulla oblongata, out of the foramen magnum you learned about on the skull, and runs down our spinal column. And it runs all the way down our spinal column down to the level of about L2, the second lumbar vertebra. Now, we, in our neck, we have what's called a cervical enlargement. So the spinal cord has this enlargement up here. That's called the cervical enlargement. And it has an enlargement down here. It, even though it's, it's more up into the thoracic area, it's called the lumbar enlargement. Now we have 31 pair of spinal nerves, 31 pair. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because we actually have eight cervical, eight pair of cervical nerves. So because the first pair of cervical nerves actually comes off before C1, right? So we have eight pairs of cervical nerves. You have 12 pair of thoracic nerves. You have five lumbar five sacral and one pair which is called the coccygeal nerve so one pair down here by the coccyx bone that you learned about so if you remember your, your vertebrae you have cervical vertebrae you have thoracic lumbar they had the sacrum the the nerves come off at those levels so at each level of a vertebra down the, the spinal column is where you would have a pair of spinal nerves come off you always have a right one and a left one all right. Now we're going to get into what are called the plexuses as well. If you notice here, you can pretty much learn the anatomy of the spinal cord off of this picture. Um, at the very tip down here, this where the spinal cord makes this tip is called the conus medullaris, this tip. And radiating downward from this tip at about L1 to L2, we have these little uh, nerve bands that come down the rest of the spinal column. So these nerve bands that come down the rest of the spinal column column actually looks like hairs on the horse on a horse's tail, look like little hairs. So we call that the cauda equina. 
So all these nerve fibers that are running down from the conus medullaris is called the cauda equina. The very tip of the bottom of the cauda equina, where all the fibers are coming, there's a little connective tissue membrane, those extensions we talked about, that anchors the spinal cord to the coccyx bone. That's called the phylum terminale. So just some important names here. We have the cervical enlargement. We have the lumbar enlargement. You have the conus medullaris, that little point. You have these nerve fibers that come down the rest of the spinal column called the cauda equina. Cauda means tail, equina is horse. So it looks like a horse's tail. That's why it's called cauda equina. Then down at the bottom, you have the attachment called the phylum terminale. Now we're not identifying every single nerve, but I'll point out some of the ones that are, are pretty important. If you notice over here, we have what's called a cervical plexus, <clears throat> which is uh, nerve C1 through C5. They even tell you which nerves that there are. A plexus is a compilation of nerves that come off the same area of the spinal cord. So the cervical plexus is coming off the cervical region. The cervical plexus have these you know, important nerves there, but the only one that's vitally important for you for this test coming off of the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is the nerve that activates your diaphragm so you can breathe. So that's why that one's important, right? The phrenic nerve comes off the cervical plexus. Now the brachial plexus does originate superiorly at a continuation of C5, but goes through thoracic one, right? So we have these, we have these nerves that come off what's called the brachial plexus that go into your shoulder and your upper arm and part of the upper uh, back of your shoulder. The, Real important ones are your axillary nerve that goes to your armpit, the median nerve, radial and ulnar nerve that go down your arm. So these go down your arm. The musculocutaneous nerve, that stays more superficial, allows you to have some tactile stimulation from our skin, right? And uh, feedback from our muscle. But the axillary, median and radial nerve you should focus on when you're when you're trying to identify these things. We then have a lumbar plexus, L1 through L4. Several nerves come off of it, right? But really an important nerve that, really two important nerves that come off of the lumbar plexus are your femoral and your obturator nerves. All right, the femoral and obturator. So try and, and observe those on that model. Uh, after I get done today, you can go pull up the model, start looking at that. Off of the sacral plexus, oh, so the lumbar region, the lumbar plexus comes off the lumbar region. The sacral plexus, the last plexus, comes off of the nerve fibers from the sacral region. L4 through S4 is the sacral plexus. Now there's a couple of nerves that are kind of but the most important one is a sciatic nerve. You, everybody knows about sciatic, you know, the problem, they get burning pain down their leg. Well, that's a compression of the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve is actually the largest nerve in our body coming off the sacral plexus and runs all the way down the back of our leg, all right? All right, so you can learn a good bit off of this picture. I don't think you're gonna have this picture, I'm not sure, but. Just go through the pre and post lab assignments and pull up the, the uh, spinal cord model that's in the Quizlet. All right, now, as far as identifying the parts of a spinal cord, you can learn everything off this picture. Well, almost everything. First of all, we have white matter, which is lighter, and gray matter, which is darker. Remember, gray matter is made up of unmyelinated neurons and neuron cell parts. White matter, is composed of myelinated neurons, right? So this is what we have. This is the anterior side of the spinal cord here. This is the posterior side of the spinal cord back here. This is the posterior median sulcus, where it indents inward on the back side of the spinal cord. The larger indentation on the front side of the spinal cord, 
is called the anterior median fissure. Now, the white matter is separated into what we call columns. So we have posterior white columns, posterior white columns. You have lateral white columns here and here, and you have anterior white columns right there. So you have posterior white columns, lateral white columns, and anterior white columns. That's what we call the white matter. The gray matter is separated into what we call horns. So you have posterior gray horns here and here. You have lateral gray horns here and here. And you have anterior gray horns in the front here and here. Posterior, lateral, anterior gray horns. Posterior, lateral, and anterior white columns. Now notice these neurons that the artist of the picture drew in. Here's our spinal nerve right here. Spinal nerves always have two attachments to the spinal cord. There's what we call the posterior root of a spinal nerve here. It's called the posterior root of the spinal nerve or dorsal root. Posterior root of dorsal root. And then this is the anterior root of a spinal nerve. So this is the anterior root. This is the dorsal or posterior root. Where the posterior root and the anterior root join together, from that point going into the body is called the spinal nerve. Now notice these neurons. The blue neuron is a sensory neuron. The blue neuron is actually carrying electrical impulses to the spinal cord via the posterior root of a spinal nerve. All sensory information goes up the posterior root. We then have our synapses in here and we would then have our motor output through the anterior root that then would go to the effectors in the body like skeletal muscle. So these neurons could go to your skeletal muscle and make your muscle contract. So we always have sensory input coming in the back motor output coming out the front of the spinal cord, all right? Now, in the middle of the gray matter is a hollow tube that runs all the way up and down our spinal cord. So the very middle of our spinal cord is hollow and it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. That's called the central canal, the central canal. Um, I wonder if I have another picture to show you in a minute. I don't, yeah, I do. All right, I'm going to get back to the spinal cord and some things that we have to identify in a minute. Now, earlier in a conversation in chap the, the nervous tissue chapter, I said, if you caught that, that we did not have any nerves in our brain and no nerves in our spinal cord. And that's true. You don't have any nerves in your brain or spinal cord. You have a lot of neurons, but not a nerve. So what is a nerve then? Well, a nerve is a connective tissue wrapping of many, 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 many neurons that course along the same path. So here they have a representation of a nerve, a spinal nerve, and the spinal nerves have connective tissue wrappings around them, very similar to that of skeletal muscle that we, we learned about. If you remember, the outer connective tissue wrapping around the muscle was called epimysium. The outer connective tissue wrapping around a nerve is called the epineurium. So the, the connective tissue wrappings are called the neurium, something neurium. So the outermost one is called the epineurium. Now the axons of the neurons are bundled together into these circular arrangements called fossicles. So there's a bundle of, ne of neuron axons here, there, there, so forth and so on. That's called a fossicle. There's a connective tissue membrane that separates one fossicle from another fossicle in the nerve. That connective tissue membrane is called the perineurium. <clears throat> 
then se separating each of the neurons from one another inside of the fossicle. So they're insulated from each other. We have what's called the endoneurium, surrounds each individual axon of each neuron. So there's a whole bunch of neurons in one nerve. Now, I said there's no nerves in your brain or spinal cord, and that's true because we do not have connective tissue on the inside of our brain. You do not have connective tissue on the inside of your spinal cord. So our neurons in our brain and spinal cord are not wrapped together in connective tissue like this. You do have a lot of neurons in there, but no nerves per se. All right, let's look at our spinal cord again and identify some of the branches that come off of the spinal cord. So here is a section, <clears throat> transverse section through our, uh, looks like the area of T1, right? This is a thoracic vertebra right here. The spinous process, transverse process, vertebral body, spinal cord running in the middle, right? Now this area above the spinal cord and below it, where you see little blood vessels, that's called the epidural space. This is where people would get the epidur epidural, like pregnant women get the epidural medicine to, during pregnancy to have the baby. So that's where the medicine goes in the epidural space. However, just in, inside there, lining that space right there is the dura mater. Now the arachnoid mater attaches to it. So just in, in there where you see these little lines in there, that's called the subarachnoid space, cerebrospinal fluids flowing in that little cavity around the spinal cord. Then we have these little ligaments at each little section called the denticulate ligament in there. And then you see the spinal cord, the white matter and the gray matter in the middle. The pia mater is directly attached to the spinal cord, so you can't really see that on here. But what is important here are these different branches. So this is the posterior side of the spinal cord. I know that because this is a spinous process. This is the anterior side of the spinal cord because the vertebral body faces anteriorly. So this is the anterior median fissure, and this is the posterior sulcus in the back. Now coming off of the posterior side of the spinal cord is the posterior root of a spinal nerve. That's what that little root is. On the anterior side, that would be called the anterior root. Then they join together to form the spinal nerve. Now, the spinal nerve has two main branches. The branches are called a ramus. That's what a branch is, a ramus. So we have a branch from the spinal nerve that goes to our back and innervates back musculature. All the muscles in called the posterior ramus. Then we have what's called the anterior or ventral ramus. This would wrap around the front of our body, going to your chest or your abdominal cavity and the like, coming back around the front. So that would be called the anterior ramus. We have at each level of the spinal column, little branches that come off and interconnect the spinal nerve to a very special ganglion which is a series of neuron cell bodies. This is called the sympathetic ganglion or the sympathetic trunk. It's part of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. So this little bitty ball you see here runs up and down the length of the spinal column. That little ball is connected to the spinal nerve via these two branches. These two branches collectively are referred to as the rami communicantes. That's what those branches are. So you always have these two little rami communicantes of anterior ramus and a posterior ramus from a spinal nerve. All right, let's talk about the plexuses for a minute. The cervical plexus comes off of all the cervical vertebrae you see here, C1 to C5 and they're named because of the level they're, that they're coming off of the vertebral column. And off of this particular 
plexus, the one nerve that I want you to make sure you go and look for is the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is the nerve that is going to stimulate your diaphragm for you to breathe. So that's why that one's going to be important. So you have to know it comes off of the cervical plexus and that the cervical plexus it extends from C1 to C5. Now you see the brachial plexus is going to begin just past here. And the brachial plexus includes C5 through C8. The rest of the cervical, we come off the cervical region of the spinal column and all the way to T1. So what nerves are important that come off of the brachial plexus? Well, the axillary nerve here is important. The All right, can y'all still hear me? I can now. Where did where did my internet cut out? What what was I on? The brachial plexus. You oh, good. That means it. just this slide. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So basically, not just to to speed up a little bit, just know what the plexuses are, which nerves. There, that are included at those levels, and then concentrate on the, on the nerves I'm pointing out. The axillary nerve, the median, radial, and ulnar for the brachial plexus, right? Now, I listed them out on this slide right here. Uh, I did include musculocutaneous, but I don't think you have to identify that one. I really think it's axillary, radial, median, and ulnar for those. The lumbar plexus, extends from L1 to L4. And the nerves on there that are important that you should be able to identify is the femoral nerve you see right here, and then the obturator nerve. The femoral nerve is gonna be the bigger one. It's gonna be above the obturator nerve when you go to look at it on the model, but basically just these two nerves from the lumbar plexus. The sacral plexus extends from L four to L five ish in that range, all the way through S one, S four. Right. And that's, again, I'm using this terminology to coincide with the levels of the vertebra and the vertebral column. Now <clears throat> the largest nerve in the body arises from the sacral plexus. It is a sciatic nerve and it goes all the way down our leg. So don't worry about the common fibular and the uh, tibial and all that. We're just going to call that the sciatic nerve. You're going to see it's the big one that goes down your leg. All right. Now let's talk about this spinal cord physiology a little bit, white matter and gray matter. And I'm going to, with, regard, with regards to reflexes and how they happen, and I'm going to teach it from this picture, which shows what is called a reflex arc. A reflex arc is composed of the different structures involved in relaying information from the periphery of the body to the central nervous system and back to the periphery of the body. It's called a reflex arc. Basically, it's the pathway that the information takes. So let's look at this simple reflex. Here they show the skin with a nail going into the skin. Obviously, that's going to hurt. So we have sensory receptors in the skin that will respond to us sticking our skin with a needle or a nail. That sensory neuron within fire and action potential up the nerve 
it would always carry the information up what's called the posterior root of the spinal nerve. Oh, by the way, this bulgy area is where the neuron cell bodies of sensory ner neurons are located. Sensory neurons are always these, these unipolar neurons. So their cell bodies are always housed in this little bulgy section. This little bulgy section is called the posterior root ganglion. A ganglion is where you have a whole bunch of neuron cell bodies in one place. It's called a ganglion. So the sensory neuron carries the information through the posterior root into the spinal cord. We then have a synapse with an interneuron that stimulates a motor neuron to fire an action potential that always leaves via the anterior root and enters the spinal nerve and goes to the muscles. Now, this motor neuron would make this muscle, which is called the effector, contract, and you would withdraw, like if we stepped on the nail, you would pick your foot up. That's actually a somewhat complex reflex. I'm about to show you that one. Or if you stick your finger with a needle, like I said earlier, you pull your hand back. So we have to contract musculature, our skeletal muscle, in order to make our body part move away from where we're being hurt. So this is the stimulus. The sensory neuron fires, the motor neuron fires, and we activate our effector, which in this case is a skeletal muscle. So since skeletal muscle in this case is our effector, this would be called a somatic nervous system reflex because skeletal muscle is the effector of the somatic nervous system. So the last thing we have to talk about are the terminologies for reflexes then right? The vocab vocabulary, really. So reflexes can be called ipsilateral or contralateral. And that depends on what side sensory information comes into the spinal cord and what side the motor information leaves. So in this case, since the sensory information comes in and the motor information leaves on the same side of the spinal cord. This will be called an ipsilateral reflex. The word ipsilateral, ipsy means on the same side. So ipsilateral means on the same side of the cord. Now I'm gonna show you a reflex in a second. That's a contralateral reflex. Contralateral reflexes occur this way. It's where the sensory information comes in one side of the spinal cord, but then crosses over through, I forgot to tell you, this is called the gray commissure, crosses over the middle of the gray matter and then stimulates a motor neuron to leave on the anterior uh, root on the other side of the spinal cord. That would be called a contralateral reflex because the sensory information comes in one side, but the motor information leaves on the other side. The other terms we have are these, monosynaptic and polysynaptic. So mono means one, poly means many. So really how many synapses do we have that makes up the reflex arc? Well, in this case, with this simple diagram, this represents an ipsilateral reflex because information comes and goes on the same side, but it's also called a polysynaptic reflex because we have more than one synapse. So see, we have a synapse between the sensory neuron and the interneuron here and between the interneuron and a motor neuron there. So this would be an ipsilateral polysynaptic reflex for this particular generic example. And then we have something called reciprocal innervation. So I'm going to show you what that is off of the stretch receptor reflex, which is a, a common reflex. It's called the patellar tendon reflex that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. If a doctor hits your knee with a hammer, your leg kind of flies up. <coughs> and this is a reflex to help protect our tendon and our muscle from being overly stretched. So look what happens with this reflex. The stimulus is this. The doctor hits the patellar tendon right below the kneecap, the patella. It, when you hit it, it stretches the tendon inward. 
Now, when the tendon is stretched inward, it pulls on your muscle, which stretches your muscle. So we have special stretch receptors in our muscle called muscle spindles. This muscle spindle always is telling the nervous system how stretched your muscle is. <coughs> Excuse me. So the muscle spindle is going to be stretched. It fires the sensory information into the central nervous system, the spinal cord, along the sensory neuron. It goes into the posterior root of the spinal cord where we have several branches off of that neuron. One of the branches is going to go up the spinal cord to the brain because your brain is going to be made aware of the fact that the reflex occurred. You can feel it. So one branch is going to the brain saying, hey, I felt that. But then we have these two branches. One branch of the spinal nerve goes to a motor neuron that goes to the muscle that is being stretched. This positive sign means excitatory. So one way you can alleviate a muscle that is, that is being stretched is to contract it. So this first motor neuron is going to be stimulated to cause your quadricep group muscles to contract. And when your quad group muscles contract, it pulls on the patellar tendon, which makes your leg extend at the knee. Your leg flies up because of your quad muscles contracting. Now, in order to make our leg extend at the knee, we have to do something else, though. We have to relax antagonistic muscle group, which is the hamstring muscle group, the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus and semimembranosus muscles you guys are identifying. So in order to make these muscles relax, we have what's called reciprocal innervation. Notice the sensory neuron not only tells the brain that you feel the reflex, it tells the, the quad group muscles to contract by stimulating that motor neuron, but it also makes a synapse with an inhibitory interneuron. <clears throat> excuse me, which inhibits the motor neuron that goes to your antagonistic muscle group, the hamstring. So by inhibiting this neuron, which is called reciprocal inhibition, we inhibit the antagonistic muscle group and our leg extends at the knee. <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so I'm choking here. This particular reflex is an ipsilateral reflex. Information comes in and leaves on the same side. However, it is a polysynaptic reflex because we have multiple synapses here, right? So ipsilateral and polysynaptic reflex is the stretch reflex. Hold on one second. The tendon reflect in order to prevent your muscle. All right, can y'all hear me again? I didn't know my internet went out again. All right, did y'all hear that last slide? Yes. All right, very good. All right, so the last slide, sorry, my internet's acting up. Um, the last slide talks about this tendon reflex, which is an ipsilateral reflex and uh, a polysynaptic reflex. So this reflex has a receptor in and around the tendon, which is called the tendon organ. And it helps prevent 
too much tension from the on the tendon, don't rip it. So our muscles po possibly could contract so hard that it would pull on that tendon too hard. So when we're trying to extend at our knee, our quad group muscles are contracting, pulling on the patellar tendon. So if it's pulling on the patellar tendon too much, the tendon organ fires off a potential down the sensory neuron to the spinal cord. Our brain is made aware of the fact that the reflex is occurring. And here we have a polysynaptic reflex. One is going to be an inhibitor neuron to the quadruples to be inhibited. So they stop contracting. But at the same time, our motor neuron that goes to our hamstring, hamstring group muscles is stimulated and it causes those muscles to contract and we flex at the knee. So we pull our leg back. This is called the tendon reflex. All right, so my internet's acting up. I think I'm gonna call it there. Um, if you guys can still hear me, if you have any questions, I'll field some questions right now.